Let me be the first to welcome you to tonight's Distinguished Industry Lecture Series. One of the many things, in my opinion, that sets the UK Ag Equine programs apart from the rest is that we're located right here in the horse capital of the world. And what that means to me is that if the best in the industry don't live here, then they come here. And that's one of the reasons that we're all here tonight is that we have two guests that um, have come into town for different reasons and we're so privileged to be able to hear from them tonight. The Distinguished Industry Lecture Series is one of the UK Ag Equine Program's signature events, which gives our students the opportunity to connect with and learn from the industry's best, whether they are in Kentucky or they whether they come to visit Kentucky. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Ag Equine programs, they are an overarching framework that encompasses everything related to equine at the university, whether it's the undergrad degree program, cutting edge research, or statewide outreach, and particularly that those activities located here in the College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment. One of the most instrumental players in the creation development and growth of the UK Ag Equine programs is Dr. Nancy Cox, who happens to be the new Dean of our college. So please welcome Dean Cox as she comes forward to share her thoughts on tonight's event. Thank you and let me add to Jill's welcome for you all to the College of Agriculture, Food and Environment, and uh, we are so excited about tonight's event. Either one of our speakers would have been a huge draw, but to have them both together is truly a dream team, and we really appreciate Dr. Stuart Brown for arranging this. We also thank Haggard Equine Medical Institute for the, uh, for the sponsorship. Um, there's a lot to celebrate at this time in Central Kentucky. One is, I think we can say now the winter is over, but we've, we, we're having the Keeneland meet finishing up, Rolex about to start, the Derby next, and we have a season of birth in the reproductive capital of the equine world. And it even makes it better to have this distinguished industry lecture tonight. And so thank you all for coming. Could I ask all the UK students, faculty, and staff to raise your hand? Great. <laughs> I know they join me in welcoming all of you, and I think this audience is composed of people from all walks of life that uh, have come here to celebrate the horse. At Equine Programs, our motto is the horse is at the heart of everything we do. And um, the horse and the heart are two themes that we think about a lot. Um, I think many of our students now, we have 277 undergrad majors right now, and that they have been here, uh, our program started in 2007, unofficially, 2009 officially. Um, but we have those students who I think have come here to the horse capital of the world to pursue their dream in horses. Uh, they have a rigorous program, they all do internships, and 65% um, of our students are from out of state. I think some of you in this room who aren't our students or too senior to be our students, also came here to this region because of your passion for the horse. And uh, we celebrate everyone who, who is a part of this event and who is a part of the, the horse capital of the world. Um, I'd like to thank Dan Rosenberg for giving the idea for having the format that we're gonna have tonight. We've had several of these distinguished lecture series and I know our guests are proud. They don't have to make their own speech, they just get to be interviewed. So, Dan Rosenberg gets the credit for that. Dan Liebman has been a stalwart interviewer for all of these, and, and we so appreciate it. Um, and the most special thing about this event tonight is that we are celebrating the life and the spirit of the late Christine Camella Brown, um, Stewart's wife, another person who came to the horse capital of the world to pursue her dreams and touched so many people in this community. And so we're really proud and honored that we can count her as a UK alum, but we, uh, she, she was one of the people that, were, that we all kind of appreciate and another person who has left a mark on the horse capital of the world. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Cox. 
every year we ask a student to come up here and give a few minutes um, of their time to talk about the student perspective of what the Distinguished Industry Lecture Series means to the students here in the program. Uh, tonight's speaker is Bethany Wuerl. She is a junior equine science and management major who hails most recently from Indiana. She is currently employed at Windstar Farms and is a member of Vision 2020. She was selected by her peers in the horse racing club to provide the student perspective to tonight's event. Hi, I'm Bethany Wuerl, a junior here at the university studying equine management. I'm here today to help introduce two very distinguished horsemen, but more importantly, I'm here as a student to have the opportunity to listen to the experience of two industry professionals who have both impacted their respective horse industries in a positive way. Growing up in Indiana, I had always wanted to be a part of the thoroughbred racing industry, but had little exposure. Uh, after learning about UK and the fact that they have a major for those interested in the equine industry to follow e either the business option or the science option, I was ecstatic and I wanted to come to UK ever since I was a freshman in high school. Uh, UK was the only college I applied to and I followed my dreams down here to Kentucky to the horse capital of the world to pursue a career in the equine industry. And I am just one of many students here tonight with a dream such as this. An opportunity like this is so important to the students here, and not just the students, but also the members of the community who came out tonight and have a chance to listen to these professionals speak and bring the equine community together. As a proud member of the UK Horse Racing Club, which is one of seven equine-related clubs and teams here on campus, I am proud to say that we do events such as this all the time. Every month we try to have an industry professional, preferably non-academic, come and speak to the students at, on campus here and share their experience and wisdom. We also do tours to top of the line equine facilities around uh, the Kentucky area. Equine farms, um, we'll go to the, the track and everything like that and really bring students together who are not only fans of horse racing, but would like to have careers in the industry as well. We're a professional organization focused on bringing students together. And it's definitely a proud thing to say that, you know, I'm a leader of the club helping network students with professionals and listen to them to try and help plan their future. So what we want to do for those of you tonight who are either students or um, members of the community is help us bring new ideas to the club. Uh, we're always looking to the future and next year we want, we want to continue to have top of the line professional, professionals come and speak to us because it is such a great thing to have. Uh, so if you would like afterwards come and find either me or one of the officers in the audience tonight of the horse racing club. If you're a student we would love to talk to you about the club if you're interested in joining or if you're an, a professional in the audience tonight, we would love to hear from you. And our, just a special thank you to our guests tonight, uh, Buck and Graham. You are so inspirational. Graham, I, you're one of my favorite trainers because you have one of my all-time favorite horses, Animal Kingdom, who, of course, won the Derby for us and won the Dubai World Cup, which is such an accomplishment to do both of those things. It's always great going to Keeneland and seeing Graham's horses run. And then Buck, I first got to see you in the 2010 World Equestrian Games, and it was incredible. Uh, and I'm super excited to see you at the Rolex this year. Just to be in your guys' presence is truly an honor, and we're so thankful to have you here. And a special thank you to Haggards, who put this all together and made it possible. Again, this is such a, a great experience to have, especially for students. These two horsemen here followed their dreams on the back of horses, and a lot of us want to do the same. Thank you. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Tonight's speakers were invited by Dr. Stuart Brown. Dr. Brown is a member of Haggard Equine Medical Institute 
and really among countless other activities, serves on the Equine Programs Advisory Committee to the Dean. I'm gonna ask Dr. Brown to come up here to, to the podium to set the stage for tonight's unique pairing of guests and also to introduce our fantastic moderator. I like how Bethany was a tough act to follow and then Dr. Stowe turned this over to me, but thank you, <laughs> thank you uh, for that. Uh, on behalf of the doctors and the staff of Haggard Equine Medical Institute in collaboration with the uh, University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, I want to really thank you all for coming tonight uh, for what's truly uh, a unique uh, edition of the 2014 Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, we're honored to have two exemplary examples of, uh, of leaders in our industries that have uh, taken an, the opportunity to come here in a confluence of their uh, activities in Lexington to take the time to come and speak to the students of the equine program here and to share some of their experiences with them. And so uh, I really appreciate uh, all of you coming tonight. Um, it's great. Uh, Graham is, uh, has a string of horses here at Keeneland, has been running here at the race meet, preparing for yet another uh, opportunity to uh, try to win the Kentucky Derby again this year with uh, his prospect uh, uh, that, that he's preparing to, to come into uh, this year into ring weekend. And then we've also got Buck Davidson here who's going to ride not one, but two, but three horses this week uh, that are entered in uh, the Rolex three-day uh, event. Uh, at the horse park and so uh, we're truly honored that they were able to take the time to come out and speak with us tonight. Um, I also have the pleasure of introducing uh, to start off with Dan Liebman. Uh, Dan's been a friend of mine and known for a while and he's, uh, we've been fortunate enough to have him as the moderator for this event uh, since its inception. He's a native of Frankfort, Kentucky, a graduate of the University of Kentucky's School of Journalism, a 2009 winner of the school's Outstanding Alumni Award, a noted handicapper, uh, writer and editor. He's been the editor of the Blood Horse magazine, deputy editor of the Racing Times, and columnist for the Daily Racing Forum. Um, additionally, he's a noted entrepreneurial restaurateur and owner of Serafini's in Frankfurt, and a uh, good friend uh, of mine and a uh, member of the Big Blue Nation uh, who I've run into a number of times at basketball events this year. So uh, certainly like to welcome Dan uh, to tonight's uh, evening. Um, our other two gentlemen that have joined us tonight, as I stated before, uh, 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 initially I introduced Graham Motion to you tonight. Dan, uh, Graham is a native of Cambridge, England. Um, he uh, has a wonderful background uh, growing up there, a background not only in flat racing but also in steeplechase racing. Um, noted to many of you as the trainer of the 137th Kentucky Derby winner Animal Kingdom, as well as the 2013 winner of the Dubai World Cup. He, um, his father was a U.S. representative of Tattersalls as well for the thoroughbred industry, and so uh, obviously has a tremendous background uh, within our industry and the thoroughbred industry uh, in the States. He um, uh, initially worked with Hall of Fame trainer Jonathan Shepard, uh, known to many of you all as a, a wonderful uh, horseman as well, steeplechase uh, trainer as well as flat racing, uh, as well as with Bernie Bond. He uh, has saddled over a thousand winners, He's accompanied tonight by his lovely wife, Anita Motion, and they have two children. Um, they have their Herringswell stable in Louisville, Pennsylvania, where he uh, is centered and stationed predominantly there at the Ferry Hill Training Facility. Um, Buck uh, is, a, uh, again, another noted horseman um, who hails from uh, the Pennsylvania area. He has a training facility in Ocala, Florida, where he winters most of his horses um, this time of year and soon be traveling back to Regalsville, Pennsylvania, where he uh, has his summer home. Um, he is um, currently ranked as the, uh, or last this year, as the number third uh, three-day eventing rider in the world. Uh, last year, he was the number one U.S. rider uh, ranking for uh, the three-day eventing group. He, he is at uh, 2013 won the Pinnacle Trophy as the uh, the leading ranked U.S. rider for Rolex last year. Um, as I said before, he's uh, also uh, riding three prospects this year, and in the, in the, we wish him the greatest of luck this, in this year's edition of Rolex. He's also been a member of the Pan American team, uh, has ridden uh, ridden there and uh, and competed, and he's the son of a legendary eventing um, rider as well. His father, Bruce Davidson Sr. So. I've been asked um, a number of times just exactly uh, how this whole evening came together and what was the underpinning for this. 
And so the, so, the, so the truth of that story is, is that the underpinning for this evening is it's, this is a, is a discussion or a lecture series that's rooted in concentric circles. It's the concentric circles that have one intersecting point that was uh, Christine Camella Brown. She was a connecting point between uh, both Graham, Buck, and myself um, through sort of an interesting set of circumstances. She had, uh, my wife was a quite accomplished three-day eventing rider, very much enjoyed the uh, process of developing horses and spending time with her prospects. She had ridden for a number of years with Ralph Hill, uh, Mike and Emma Winter, and then most recently have been riding with Buck Davidson. And she and Buck developed a great uh, relationship with one another. They valued a lot of the same things in terms of the identification of horses and their potential as prospects. And they were careful, uh, very meticulous in the planning process for developing those horses as they trained them for the multidisciplined uh, activities that exist in, within the three-day eventing discipline. As well, she also was a great admirer of thoroughbred trainers. And one thing we probably left out in her bio that was uh, probably an oversight on my part is that she was also a thoroughbred breeder and raised a number of foals on our farm in Woodford County, Kentucky. And it was always very, very important to her to give a great foundation to all of the horses that she raised. Because no matter where they wound up or whether they, where they turned out, she always wanted them to be adaptable, to be trainable, because it would serve them well whether they were at the racetrack or whether or not they actually found another discipline in show jumping or three-day eventing or dressage. And so one of the things that she uh, was also noted for was she was a great equine neonatal technician when she worked at our hospital uh, at Haggard's when I first fell in love with her. And so she, was a, she had a tremendous ability for, for uh, great nursing care, which was, was her profession as well. And so she got a mare given to her um, that uh, she acquired from, from Mr. Jim Taffel, who had been a good client of mine over the years. And this first foal that was out of the mare was a dystocia that occurred this time of year, right about April, that uh, turned out to be a filly that uh, we resuscitated after delivery. Christine spent months rehabilitating with the help of Kim Sprayberry at our equine neonatal facility. And this filly, I hold out as a testament to a lot of my clients who say, you know, whether or not these things are really worth saving or how much money to put into them. Well, there was no quitting, Christine, about this filly. And she always saw the ability uh, and the fight and the potential in this filly that's indelible, I think, that's truly one of the great qualities of thoroughbred horses. And so as she watched that filly grow up and as she bought her back from the September sale because she wasn't sure she wanted to sell her, <laughs> And as she was truly devoted to the fact that this filly was faithfully uh, left in her hands for her career, she sought out a trainer that she believed exemplified the values that she had in developing horses. And so she selected Graham Motion to take this filly. And so Graham, with the help of uh, two of my clients here, uh, Mark McLean and... Um, and Clifford Berry helped to put Graham in touch with Christine, and she went, that filly down named Patinka, as an exchange rate filly, went down and spent time at uh, Webb Carroll's facility with Travis Durer, and then came to Fair Hill to spend time with Webb, I mean with Graham this past, uh, past year. And so on a fateful day on October the 3rd, I had the great opportunity to go up and watch this filly run at Delaware Park. And on that day, I met, uh, was met at the uh, airport by uh, my good friend Buck Davidson. And we got to spend a wonderful day with Graham at Ferry Hill watching him send out sets of horses that he trained. And one of the things that I took away from the day as I walked around with them and I saw Better Talk Now and a number of other horses was the interchange that I saw that existed between the two of them that really reinforced for me how Christine had gravitated to both of these people because they both were meticulous in their preparation and what they saw and what they believed in and the foundation of the principles that they had for developing charges that were in their care. And so I was rewarded tremendously on that day, not only from the win that we all got to share in the winter circle that day, which is probably as great as any stakes race that that filly would ever have the potential for, for acquiring, um, but also for the opportunity that I had to spend with these two gentlemen and listen to their thoughts about the process of developing horses that were in their care. And so it was 
a wonderful opportunity for me to have the, at least the insight of that occasion to bring them to here tonight for the reunitement of the opportunity for that experience and one more shot from this concentric point that was Christine Brown that brought us all here tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dan Lieberman. going to ask some questions of, of both Graham and Buck, and then I'm going to let them kind of exchange between their two on some subjects, and then I have questions that have been submitted by students that we're, that we're going to ask. And I don't wear a watch, so if we start to go long, you can <laughs> scream at me over here. I don't believe in them. So <clears throat> anyway, and, and I'm going to sort of bounce back between the, the two asking questions here. So Graham, we're going to start with you. I don't have a watch either. <laughs> well, then, then we ought to get along fine. I got one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, pretty much what you do, the stopwatch is, well, actually both of you, the stopwatch is important, but we'll go there later. Um, Stuart mentioned, you know, being raised in England and, and your parents both uh, involved in, in horses. So was there ever any doubt that you were going to end up in an equine field as you were growing up? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I was very much brought up around horses. My mom was actually one of the first um, ladies on the racetrack in the States. She galloped horses at Belmont, believe it or not. Um, she looked after a Grand National winner, uh, the last mayor that won the Grand National back in 1950-something. Um, so it was very much ingrained in me. I always wanted to be a jockey as a kid. Um, I soon realized that there was no chance of that <laughs> happening, <laughs> which was probably a good thing. Was that um, skill or weight? <laughs> or? Probably both. <laughs> um, but that's what drew me to it. I actually, after I, I graduated from Kent in Connecticut, and when I left school, I went to work on a, a horse farm in, in France. And I quick, quickly realized that was something I did not want to do. It was way too slow. And they had two-year-olds there, and I got more involved in the training of the two-year-olds. And I actually called my dad, you know, towards the end of the year that I was there and said, he said, uh, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I really want to train horses. I, this is what I, I think this is going to be my passion. And he um, set me up to go to Jonathan Shepherd's. And I think his reason for doing that was he thought one winter in Pennsylvania, <laughs> working with Jonathan Shepherd, he thought that would completely put me off. <laughs> and I ended up being there for five years. And I actually was around Buck's dad very much uh, in that area. And uh, I think you must be quite a bit younger than me. <laughs> anyway, so that's how I got. And, and did you ride with your mother? You know, did... no, not necessarily. Um, I, I rode very little. I actually learned to gallop horses when I went to work for Jonathan. I think there was okay. one horse I could ride the whole first year I was there, and I'd sit behind the guy that I knew would not yell at me if I got run off with <laughs> or went by him. Or, so that was that was how I got started. You know, and as we're speaking to students, there are so many disciplines of this industry that you can head toward, and so it sounds like you knew right away the the breeding industry was not where you wanted to be because it's a slower pace. Uh, you wanted to be at the racetrack. Yeah, I like the action. I liked, uh, I like the action. What can I say? That, that's what it's all about, and that, that's what appealed to me. Okay. Your, your father, of course, very well-known bloodstock agent and agent for sale company. What do you recall as, as lessons that he imparted to you about the horse industry and, and maybe things that you still reflect on today that help you? Don't become a bloodstock agent. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know that I, uh, look, I, I think when you're brought up with horses like we both were, you're, you're sort of, you're very much aware of what's going on. You're very involved. I remember my first memories of coming to the States as a kid were going to the auctions at Fazig Tipton in Saratoga. And I used to sit in the front row and try to understand what the auctioneer was saying, which was just mind blowing for me as an English boy coming here and listening to these, these guys rattling off. I, I remember that very clearly. I remember going around Saratoga um, and the impression it had on me, which when I think back on it, I, I, I used to go around with my dad, which is nothing compared to what my kids get to do now, um, you know, interacting with the jockeys and the agents and the trainers, which I think is so important. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hopefully they get as much out of it as I did. Okay. Buck, Graham, of course, is not the only one sitting on stage here who comes from a, from a horse family. You do as, as well. Um, your father, Bruce, an uh, Olympic medalist and um, the only winner of back-to-back -back world championships. So your early years, of course, also exposed to, to horses. So again, sort of the same question. Was there any doubt that this was a, an avenue you were going to take? Yeah, for me, there was a lot of doubt. I, um, 
I really didn't want to do it. I didn't have any interest in riding horses. It was part of the family business, and that's kind of what we did. Um, you know, I really wanted to play ice hockey. Like, I wanted to play in the NHL. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so hockey was a big thing. And sort of the guy aspect of, you know, the locker room, I really enjoyed that part. And um, so it wasn't until I had a few knee surgeries and uh, realized that I probably wasn't going to get to the NHL. I might get to Division One in hockey, and I may get to Division One in baseball. It's actually probably better in baseball and in soccer. Um, as a freshman, I was all states um, in both baseball and and uh, soccer, and then in ice hockey, I was on the 16 under national team. And um, I tore up my knee and had three surgeries, and it sort of slowed me down and everything. Um, and <clears throat> when you were a Davidson, you when you weren't in school, you were at the barn, <laughs> and you worked, and you were that was part of you know when I was 12 years old, I got sort of two options. I could go and work at the barn and start at seven, and I was done when it was done, or I could pay rent. And um, <laughs> when I lived in Unionville, there's, uh, and I couldn't drive, um, there weren't too many options. That was an easy choice. Yeah, right? and um, so anyway, I worked at the barn, and all I ever saw in horses was, it was a lot of work, and it really wasn't a lot of fun. And, um, you know, as as uh, as I got older, and um, you know, the other things, baseball wasn't exciting enough to me. Um, soccer, there's not really soccer in America. Hockey, I wasn't good enough, um, and I knew I wanted to go to major leagues in something. And this sort of started to take off. And I rode to Kentucky at Rolex when I was 17, and you know, I flew from school to ride the event, and I didn't really ride every day, and Needless to say, it was not very successful. And um, I, I still have great stories of rails laying in my lap in the show jumping and <laughs> the terrible dress size tests and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I started to realize, obviously, if I wanted to do, to do this or I wanted to be successful, I need to work at it. Mm. And um, so as I started to work at it, I started it started becoming more interesting to me. And uh, I'm sort of taken off from there. but. The, the short answer is no, I had no desire to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned that uh, in your early writing, perhaps you didn't have a lot of success, but Stuart mentioned a little bit, but let me just mention so the students know that last year you won the Pinnacle Trophy for highest place U.S. rider at Rolex, and 2011 the number one ranked rider in the U.S., so um, that drive that you were talking about, wanting to be the top at something, um, certainly you have, you have gotten there. Um, can you also talk about um, what I had uh, previously asked Graham about lessons you learned from your father um, and watching him and being around him and, and how that guides you today? Yeah, I learned a lot from my dad um, and my mom as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, my, my parents are both very, very hardworking people. Um, my dad had a sole focus. He only worried about winning every event and he didn't care what it took and um, um, but he always put in the time and the effort and he was really into the breeding and the the long-term you know outlook for the horse and he you know bred his own horses and that's the way he could stay at the top of the game for 30 years is he didn't have somebody that would go spend a million dollars to buy him a horse he would always bring them up and funny enough what ended up happening is the horses that didn't sell were the ones that he made famous because mm -hmm. nobody else wanted them, so he had to ride them. And um, so I, I learned that, you know, that there's no substitute for hard work um, in anything. And I got told as a kid, Buck, as long as you're in the top three in the country, you'll be okay. He said, if, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said, if you want to pump gas, you're the top three in the country, you'll have no problems. <laughs> but that's what you have to do. Yeah. And uh, like I remember, that, you know, and, you know, so, uh, you know, dad had that, you know, he still has it, that just tunnel vision, that's the way it's going to be. Funny enough, my mom is the, you know, dad obviously is the, the famous one, if you will, but um, my mom is the, the super competitive person, you know, still to these days, you know, like I'll call up, I might win on five horses, and 
one of them will be fifth. And what happened with that horse? Why, yeah, that's the first question. What went wrong with that one? I said, Mom, come on, give me a break. The other ones are pretty good. And, uh, you know, so with, with the industry that we're both in, you've got to work hard, but you've got to be competitive as well. And it is, um, you know, there, there is no substitute for either one. If you're, if you're not hardworking, you're not going to be competitive. You're not going to be successful. If you're not going to be successful, there's not going to be people that are going to, there's not going to be people behind you. Graham, you, you briefly mentioned Jonathan Shepard, truly a, another really remarkable horseman. Um, can you talk about your time with Jonathan and, and things you learned from him? And, and of course, you know, first impression people have of him is a, is a steeplechase trainer, but he certainly flew, proved that he could also train flat horses uh, just as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that just to go back to what Buck's saying, I mean, there's an expression: the harder the harder I work, the luckier the harder you work, the luckier you find you get. And I think that's so important in what we do. And certainly, that was the case with Jonathan. I mean, he's an absolute workaholic. Um, I actually lived in the house with Jonathan, so I got to see the day in day out running of the business, which um, I, I've never been around a, a harder worker than he was. But you know, it, it was. I mean, I base my training probably on, on what I learned there. Jonathan does things very differently from most people. Like you say, he had, he's known for steeplechases, but he also trained Stormcat, who's probably the most influential horse of our time. And I was lucky enough to be around that horse. So um, to have been around a two-year-old of the caliber that Stormcat was, and also around Bladderer, who was at least three times a Clips Award-winning steeplechaser, was fascinating. Um, we did some amazing things. You know, I took Flatter to England for the champion hurdle, which is sort of the, if you like, the derby of, of steeplechasing um, in England. And Jonathan actually prepared him to go over there um, without a race, which is unheard of. You know, the English horses have been running all winter. Uh, the race is in March, so we didn't have any steeplechasing leading up to that. And I think to have been around him, to see him prepare a horse to get ready for an event like that was extraordinary. It was... Uh, the best education I could have had was to see him getting horses ready for races like that. You, you mentioned Stormcat, and I remember W.T. Young telling me a story once about going up to the farm to, to watch Stormcat, and they were standing there, and he said, I don't see Stormcat. Here he came up a hill training, and W.T. was fascinated by that. Um, but, you know, Buck mentioned that his father um, did well with horses that didn't sell, and W.T. used to always say that how blessed he was that Keeneland turned down Stormcat for the summer sale. And, uh, and, and he truly was. It's actually a great story about that because when Stormcat was getting ready for the Breeders' Cup, um, the press would be calling and they'd say, well, how did he work? What did he go in? And one of the assistants said, well, we don't, we don't time the horses. You know, we work between telegraph poles on King Ranch. There's no, uh, <laughs> so it was very, it was very amusing to, to, to see the different approach that Jonathan had getting him ready. Yeah. I'm sure you knew then that he would turn out to be the kind of stallion course, he was. Yeah. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I think if we had known, we all would have been scared to death. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, from Jonathan then, you know, to France, um, can you talk just briefly about your time there? And, and of course, I know um, besides your time there with horses, you, you met your wife there, so it was also a very personal... Because she's person. here, I should say that's the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> even if she wasn't here. <laughs> uh, that was a great experience. I mean, it was something, even though I'd been brought up in Europe, I'd never actually worked in racing in Europe, so to be there in a, in a stable where it's so different uh, training over there. And Shanti, if you've never been there, is probably the most beautiful training facilities. Even if you're not into horses, you should see it because it's to be seen to be believed, really. Um, so I used to have to pinch myself going out on the gallops on a, on a Sunday morning when there was hardly anybody out there. And uh, it's, it's just a, a beautiful facility. So that was a great experience for me. I got to go racing with Jonathan Pease, who... Uh, um, trained for Niarkos's, who I also trained for now, and Mr. Strawbridge, who I trained for now. So it was great for me to have that kind of a, a background, get to meet different people. And I think what's so important in our business is the connections you make uh, along the road. And you, you, you never burn bridges, and you, you make the most of all your connections. I think there's so much to be said for that. Um, everyone that comes to work for me or, or whatever, or people that I meet that want to get in the industry, I just think it's so important to make the most of your connections. I read a 1992 article in which you said, after you came back to the U.S., <clears throat> I missed the jumpers, but realized if I wanted to make a living, it had to be in the flat game. Can you talk about that? Well, I think the, 
the steeplechasing in this country, it's, it's very much like point-to-pointing in England, except you do run for, for significantly more money. Um, but it's a tough road. It's, uh, it's, not, it's seasonal. It's a short season. Um, and the steeplechasing is physically tough on the horses. It's probably something somewhat comparable to what Buck deals with the, the, um, the stamina that you have to put into the horses. And then you throw in fences. You know, obviously, it's, it's a lot tougher. It's a lot more... Uh, it's the, dura- the endurance for the horses is a lot tougher, and I think uh, I think with the flat horses, although we introduce a lot more speed to them, um, I actually find it very hard now to watch the steeple chasing because you know you kind of hold your breath every time they go over a fence. But uh, it's a uh, it's a very different side of the business, and and the racing is year round, and obviously that's where the money is. Buck, have you, have you been called Buck your whole life? Where does the nickname come from? Yeah, well. I think, from what I understand, um, you know, when I was in, in my mom's stomach, uh, I was there at dinner one night, and I was kicking around, and it was Gene's buck, or the, he's bucking a lot, and I think that's just kind of how, <laughs> how I became buck. You know, obviously, I have, <coughs> I have the same na- same name as my dad, and so, uh, yeah, Buck has uh, been uh, my name the whole time. I don't think you can have a nickname any longer than that. I mean, going back, uh, yeah. we're in the womb. Yeah, uh, it's, exactly. <laughs> and so, uh, as long as it's not Bucky, people <laughs> call me Bucky. No. <laughs> the uh, speak, listening to Graham talk about steeplechase racing as I was a kid, I, I used to ride races over timber um, when I was I started when I was twelve, and um, the, my first year riding at Rolex, I had a choice of riding at Rolex, or I had a uh, choice of riding a horse that. Um, actually won the Hunt Cup uh, the next year, a horse called Shaco. I don't remember him. Back in the, uh, anyway, he, uh, <clears throat> he was like the favorite for the Maryland Hunt Cup at that time. And the Maryland Hunt Cup and Rolex were the same weekend. And so at that time in my life, it was, am I going to do eventing or am I going to do racing? And I came to the same conclusion Graham did, that there's probably not that much money in being a, a jump jockey, and uh, certainly in America. And so... Uh, the, the eventing took off, and you know, in my game, obviously, we have a lot of, you know, I, I ride and all that stuff, but I do a lot of teaching and doing clinics and stuff like that. And I was, uh, just have a funny story here when I met Stuart, and um, <clears throat> Christine came and came down to Florida and trained with me one winter, and I knew she was into saving horses and saving dogs and <laughs> this kind of stuff, and. Uh, so when you hear the story of Patinka, uh, you know, that was normal for Christine. She just, I got to, I arrived one night, I, Christine set up these clinics for me in Kentucky, and so I arrived late one night at uh, Stuart and Christine's uh, Brownstead Farm, and the clinic was going to be over the next two days, and, you know, talking with Stuart, and um, quickly realized this is a great guy, like, this is somebody I want to look up to, like. The way they interacted, the way um, he treated her with respect, and the uh, and then the next thing that sort of took me was how much Christine cared about animals, and I believe we talked about the deer she saved, and then there's probably a raccoon, and there was about 27 dogs, <laughs> and there's about 55 cats, and these different horses, and they loved every single one of them, treated them like. Um, like their kids, which they were. And um, I wasn't a huge cat fan. <laughs> uh, so anyway, it's probably about midnight, and I think, okay, it's probably time for me to go to bed. So I go to bed, and um, after realizing how much these animals mean, I get into bed, and there's this cat, Moses, in the corner of the bed. And so I'm sitting in the bed like this, and Moses comes over and growls at me. Yeah. Oh my God. So I'm like further in the side of the bed. And Moses comes over and growls one more time. Jeez, I'm out of here. And so I take my pillow. There's no way I'm taking the covers because Moses needs the covers. And I realize that. And this is the first time I've, you know, been in their home. And I'm not messing with that cat. So I take my pillow and I sleep on the floor. And uh, the cat is sitting in the bed happily. Mm-hmm. Next morning, you know, Stuart and uh, Christine, oh, how was your night? And 
You know, did you sleep well? Oh, yes, yeah, fantastic. Everything's perfect. <laughs> did, the, did the cat bother you? Oh, no, the cat was fantastic. <laughs> so it <clears throat> wasn't until a few years later when I became friends that um, I could tell them the cat story of Moses, and I'll never forget Moses coming with his mouth wide open. <laughs> and, um, but it's, uh, you know, I, I feel very honored and privileged, and I'm, I know Graham does too, to have a horse that uh, Christine started and, and that Stuart um, still loves. And um, she's a great lady, and um, Stuart has become one of my, my best friends and somebody that I hope in my life that I can, you know, take care of somebody the way he, he took care of Christine and the way they interacted. And um, I just think that that's uh, the most important. That's the reason why we're here. And um, it's really because of Christine and what she's done for so many animals. Well, you bring up a great point about relationships uh, in this industry that you make not just with animals but with people. Um, but it is interesting to hear a guy who goes over timbers and goes over jumps and gives up his bed to a cat. Uh, so. <laughs> got to do what you got to do. I'm not sure what that says about you, but, <laughs> uh, but I don't know. Um, but I, I do want to ask you, um, um, so the, the students know, uh, Buck won the Markham Trophy as the highest placing young rider in the U.S. Equestrian Championship three times. Uh, twice was Young Rider of the Year. So success came very early. You, you talked about you struggled early, but not for too long, actually. Um, what do you recall about those early years and, and things you learned in those early years? Well, you know, when, when I was starting off, again, my upbringing was so different than probably most of these the students here that, you know, like I lived it. I was, I didn't even know I was learning it when I was a kid, you know. I, I got dragged to Kentucky every year. Like that was just what happened. I went to an event every single weekend, you know, and Kentucky was just another event. It just, um, and so I didn't realize at the time how difficult it was to get to a, an event like Rolex and have a horse sound fit ready to go. Um, and, you know, I remember um, dad had a horse get hurt right before the Olympic Games. And, you know, he was pretty bummed out. And I said to him, I don't know what the big deal is. You got plenty more at the barn. And that, I didn't realize how difficult it was, you know, and I was, you know, probably 10 or 11 or whatever, but he always rode a lot of horses. And so for me, it was really the realization that it was more, way more difficult than I thought. And that, you know, a place like Kentucky and Rolex is a bigger deal than I really knew. It was, um, you know, for me, it was I got stuffed in the back of a tiny little car with my sister for 12 hours, and that was Kentucky to me. You know, like it was like, man, this is a long way. I hate this trip, and Nancy and I would fight. You know, and um, so really, it took me a little while to. It didn't take me a really long time to figure out that I'm a competitive person. That if I want to do well, I got to work hard at it, and. Um, that it, there are some special things that come with this, and um, you know, certainly Kentucky is the epicenter of the event world. Like everybody that's an owner, a rider, a groom, a, you know, a fan comes to Rolex, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it is uh, this year. I'm fortunate to have three of the best horses I've ever had in my life, and um, I had five entered, and they're all fit, sound, ready, um, and uh, so I just feel as I, as I get older, I get feel more and more fortunate to be able to do what I do and um, have people that back me and um, believe in me. Graham, you went from Jonathan Shepard and Jonathan Pease to Bernie Bond. That, that's a pretty big difference. Um, from that was extreme. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know Bernie Bond, he was a very hardcore old-time horseman who won the first two-year-old race every year, which was completely the opposite of what I was used to. Yeah. yeah. Um, and but a very good guy. Yeah, and of course, uh, Bernie passed away, and um, some of his owners wanted to give you the horses, so here you are all of a sudden, you're a trainer. Um, what do you remember about those, about those early days and um, um, styles that you learned from all those people? Well, funny enough, it reminds me, when it happened, Bernie always told me that when he retired, he was going to keep the owners with me. Um, I finally, I think for the first time while I was working him, took a vacation with my wife-to-be, and we went to the Virgin Islands, and I got a panic call from my assistant that Bernie was retiring, and I was off in 
in the Virgin Islands. I was about to lose all the owners, so it was kind of amusing how it came about. But we got back quickly, very quickly, and I had some, you know, three really good owners of Bernie's that got me started. Um, it had been the best thing for me. I went from working with Jonathan Shepard, who was particularly known for um, training turf horses uh, longer distance on the grass. And like I say, Bernie, it was like a tradition that he had to win the first two-year-old race every year in Maryland. And that was the most high-pressure day of my job, was making sure that didn't change when I was there. Um, it was very stressful. But it was a great education. Um, I had really barely ever clocked a horse before I went to work for Bernie. So it was, it was completely a, another extreme for me. Uh, I, another article I read uh, about you, I read a quote from trainer Butch Reed, and he said, Graham is real quiet. Sometimes it's hard to tell what he's thinking, but he's really dedicated to his horses and he puts a lot of thought and effort into it. Can you talk about what he was saying in that quote about the thought and the effort and why that's so important to you in training thoroughbreds? Well, I think every day you're out there, um, you know, that, that is your time between 6 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock, you know, at the end of the morning to try and figure out each individual horse. And you know, even though there's a lot of socializing and, and that kind of activity that goes on, you really only have a very short time to sort of, especially the more horses you have, to f figure out each individual. And I think it's something that I, I do try to spend a lot of time figuring out, picking up on things that perhaps others might not have done or, you know, my other guys that work for me. Um, you know, the difference between what we do and, and what a football coach or a, a basketball coach does is it's very similar routine, except they can't tell us what's going on, and that's where we have to step in and, and try and figure it out, and that, that's not easy to do. Buck, you mentioned um, how well your horses are doing now. Could you, could you talk about your top horses and uh, how you came to acquire them and uh, a little bit about maybe how many you keep in training and uh, that sort of thing? Um, well, my top horses that are here this weekend, um, Valley Norcastle RM, he came uh, as a six-year-old. He's 14 now. Um, my good friend Carl Siegel here um, <clears throat> yeah, purchased Reggie as a young horse, and um, we sort of brought him up. Uh, uh, sort of through the ranks, and um, you know he's national champion last year. He's the third leading all-time horse in America. Um, he's a, you know he's just a dream horse to to be around. He's uh, you know he's one of his biggest attributes is you know knock on wood he's been a sound horse. He's you know he's um, he had a bone bruise that kept him out of last year the fall season last year, but he's just. Like he's beautifully put together, um, and so I think with him, you know, he obviously has talent, but um, his biggest attribute is his soundness. And because he was able to stay sound, he was able to get trained and ridden. And you know, so over the long haul, maybe he didn't have some of the talent that some of the other ones did, but he lasted. So you could train him to be what he is today. And then, um, <clears throat> then there's um, Park Trader who. We went a little bit of a different route. Um, I rode Reggie at Burley, and uh, he was 11th there that year. But man, I've never had to ride so hard to get a horse to go around the course of my life. He, Reggie wouldn't be the bravest horse I've ever ridden. I come off that course, and I get the next horse. I don't care if it does dress up, it's going to go. And um, anyway, that horse turned into Park Trader. We had, we had sold the horse, and um, so we turned that into a, a horse that I had watched at a one star. And um, he is, he is the brave, one of the bravest horses I've ever ridden. Um, also, probably one of the most temperamental. Um, and not long after I got him, he broke my shoulder on a hack. And, um, and so he's been a bit of a work in progress. And then the, the last one is a, a mare that my dad actually bred. Um, I found the mother in a national hunt sale in Ireland. Um, and I think we got her for like $500, and the mare ended up going and being quite a nice event horse, but got hurt in the field, something stupid, but um, we decided to breed her. And anyway, this, this mare that I ride now called Petite Flower um, <clears throat> came, and she's, uh, she was, dad started her, and um, 
then sold her to a student of mine um, and as a young rider horse and that kind of stuff. And she was great, and then she's just a little bit, you know, she's super talented. She could be a dressage horse, she could be a race horse, she could be a show jumper, she's, she's got it all. Um, but, you know, the, the miscommunications that the, the girl had and the mayor um, sort of kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So finally, I started to ride her last year, and um, she won a three-star in California. And um, she's one that's, you know, she's very talented, very, um, she could be the winner this weekend, but it wouldn't shock me if she didn't make it, you know? So, uh, but she's, she's so good that it's worth the chance. And how, how many do you keep in training? How many do you have, you know, that you're getting ready? You know, talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, Florida, I have sort of two different operations, if you will. I have a, a place in Pennsylvania um, just outside Philadelphia that is uh, sort of a, more of a gentleman's farm, if you will. It's got everything. It's very fancy. It's got a beautiful indoor. It's got a beautiful outdoor ring. It's got a little cross-country course. Um, but it's quite small. I think I have, I don't know, 30 stalls or something like that. And it was, it was never designed to be an event, uh, uh, an event training facility. And now we put in all-weather gallops, and we've done a lot of stuff, but it's not organized. You know, there's fields everywhere and, and um, things like that. And then in the winter, I have a, a huge facility that I, and I rent both of these places. Um, and the place in Florida is 600 acres and it's got 60 stalls and some 40 paddocks or something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a huge part of my life is, is training people, not only horses, but um, so I have a lot of young professionals um, that come down and spend the winter with me. So. At sometimes we'll have 70, 75, 80, 85, just kind of on a rolling scale of horses and people that I have to train. Um, but basically, it, I think there's probably what, 35 or 40 guys, something like that? 40, 45. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, that we, you know, there's probably, I guess there's 45 or so that uh, <laughs> we might be building a few more stalls in Pennsylvania. Uh, but, you, you know, like, uh, yeah, for me to ride, there's probably about 30, and then, you know, the working students and the um, people like that, and then I have, you know, another 30 or 40 that are just students for the winter. So it sounds like you're training both horses and people. Uh, yeah, I mean, for what I do, it's, um, you know, there's certainly just as much training of people, and, um, you know, obviously, it's a little bit more, uh, you know, sitting here watching you guys have your legs crossed and thinking, man, maybe I should get into training because I can't do that. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, but it's, uh, there's a lot of hours in, in the saddle and not only, you know, I r sort of ride in the morning and ride, you know, 8, 10, 15, whatever, and then teach, you know, 10, 20, 30 lessons in the afternoon. So okay. um, it's, a, it's a definite, um, you know, there's a give and take. It's, it's a, you know, I have five students here, I think, that are riding at Rolex. And so it's, you do have to, you know, you have to take care of the horses that you're riding, but you also have to take care of the people that you're training. And so I enjoy that aspect. I enjoy the, the interaction of people as much as I do with the horses. So how does that work? You walk the course with the students? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I sort of see how they're doing after the dressage, and then I tell them which way to go. No, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, like here this weekend, I will, you know, if, if their times, our times don't conflict, then I will, you know, tr you help them in the dress. I shall certainly walk the course, um, certainly come back after, you know, I'm number one this weekend. Um, so I'll come back and give them feedback of what's going on and that kind of stuff and help them in the warm up if they need it. And then on, on, on uh, you know, Saturday night or whatever, whatever the horse needs as far as, you know, does he need to get rehydrated, soundness, what do we need to do to look after him, sort of help them along with that. And then Sunday, you know, help them with the jog and then obviously help them with the show jumping. And, um, you know, and, and these guys that have gotten to Rolex, just like the horses that I've trained, it's, it's, not, it's not like it happens in a year or two years or three years. It's, happens over a long period a long period of time. And so the students that have, are riding here in Kentucky, they've probably been with me, some of them, 10, 15, 15 years. And so they kind of know what, we're, what I'm thinking, and, um, you know, I rely on them 
at this level just as much. You know, we, we definitely bounce ideas off each other. And when, when we walk the courses and stuff like that, you know, maybe it's my voice that says the first idea or whatever, but there's definitely an interaction there. And, you know, they know their horses and how they've been going. And, um, you know, and then I sort of, we sort of work with that. Graham, I want to just, there, you've trained so many nice horses, but want to just mention a few um, and let you talk about them just kind of briefly. Um, I assume Better Talk Now might be like the coolest horse anybody's ever trained, or one, one of them. Um, he certainly got better with age um, and was just a, a tremendous uh, grass horse, won the Breeders' Cup turf, ran second in the Breeders' Cup turf. Can you talk about him a little bit? Yeah, I mean, he's a special horse to me. It was my first Breeders' Cup that he won. It was kind of my first really put me on the map, if you like. So we actually still have him turned out at Fair Hill. He's 11 or 12, I think. My wife would know. Um, but he ran till he was nine or ten. So he, he was a very special horse. He was, uh, his owners have become my, my closest friends. Um, he took me to Japan. He took me to Dubai for the first time. So it was a, a phenom phenomenal experience. Um, and it was just a challenge to, you know, the way, the way the longer race is set up, it was always a challenge to make sure things worked out for him. He had a particular style. He was not an easy horse. He was not the kind of horse that everybody wanted to get on in the morning. Um, he was cantankerous, actually, <laughs> and, sti and still is. Um, Ramon Dominguez uh, had an, a remarkable rapport with him, and he really figured him out. Um, so he, he was a very special horse. Um, you know, the, probably the next time we won the Breeders' Cup was with a mare called Sher Shared Account, who I think was 40 to 1. Better to now was 27 to 1 when he won the Breeders' Cup. Shared Account was 40 to 1. So. They were, uh, they were not necessarily horses we expected to do well with, but we felt very good about running them. Um, and I think that's often something that's hard to convince yourself. You know, even though a horse is going to be a long shot, sometimes you've got to take a shot. And you see Wayne Lucas do it um, a lot. You see a lot of guys do it, and I think that's something that comes with the long view. You're training, you have confidence to do that. So, And then Animal Kingdom, uh, when he won the, the Derby, he was 20 to 1. So... Those are probably the, obviously the three most influential horses that I've had. I can tell you just a, a personal story of my own about uh, shared account because I was sitting in the box at Churchill Downs with Catherine Park, who of course owned the dam. And so when shared account snuck up the hedge and got up by a neck, I was the one that got to pick her up off the floor when, uh, <laughs> when that happened. And she was going to try to get here tonight. Catherine, are you here somewhere? Uh, probably had a mare falling. Um, <laughs> couldn't get here. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Animal Kingdom. Um, obviously, Derby winners are very special horses to all of us, and certainly on a resume, uh, winning a Derby is, is so important. Um, talk about his preparation for the Derby. He came into it certainly different than, than most horses, and um, why you went to the spiral, and then kind of how he was leading up to the Derby. Yeah, I think first of all, I mean, I didn't know he was a Derby horse. Um, you, you would think that as a trainer, if you were going to win the Derby, you would know a long way out. I did not know that. Um, mm -hmm. He came to me as a three-year-old. He came to me when I was in Palm Meadows in Florida. And I'd actually, I just started training for Team Valor, and I was training a horse called um, Pluck, who was a very good. He was a champion two-year-old. He won the Breeders' Cup. And I started working Animal Kingdom with him um, when he first came in. And I'd always tell Barry, well, he worked well, but this horse, Animal Kingdom, he always seems to be going much easier. So I was starting to get a feel for the fact that he was a very good horse. Um, the first time I ran him, he was actually beaten in an allowance race, which I, I couldn't believe he was beaten because the way he trained, he was, he was sure. Um, I, I felt very good about running him. Um, by chance, we ended up running him in the spiral, even though he'd been beaten in the allowance race. He won that very comfortably, and then we knew we had a really good horse. And, um, we kind of made the decision that we would run him in the Derby as long as he worked well at Churchill Downs. He'd never been to Churchill Downs. I don't think I'd even, even breezed him on the dirt before. So it was really an unknown to us how he was going to handle it, but he worked spectacularly. Um, I remember the buzz after he worked, everyone was saying, well, Bob Baffert said he worked great. So I thought, well, that's got to be good. If Baffert said he worked great. <laughs> so we must, we must belong, right? So... Um, you know, I, I don't think the day that I let him over there, I could have imagined he would have won. I actually was concerned. You know, he worked really well, but he was kind of a sloppy, um, 
just a, an immature type of horse. And I remember watching him gallop the week leading up to it after he breathed, thinking, you know, he worked well, but boy, he just he seems so he doesn't seem to get over it particularly well in the morning. So um, he was an amazing horse, though he he was so impressive that day. I, I I think he was really unlucky not to win the Preakness. I think if he'd broken better, he probably would have won the Preakness. Dale would not agree with me, but I think he probably would have done. And then he got hurt um, in the Belmont coming out of the gate, which was you know, hugely disappointing having got to the, the highest pinnacle of, of winning a race like the Derby and then, you know, having that all just dashed away. Not only, you know, from selfish point of views, not having him to go on, but also to see this horse suffering like he was after he got hurt. was That was tough, mm -hmm. tough to watch. And I think the fact that he came back from that was just a really, um, it just showed what a remarkable horse he was. I don't think many horses would have come back from the type of injury that he had. Yeah, can you, can you talk about the the recovery and, and back in training in the Dubai World Cup? Yeah, well, he had a very tiny hairline fracture um, in his hock, which um, Dean Richardson put a screw in. Um, and he ended up having at least six months of doing very little at all. Um, and that, that was tough on the horse. He was a very big horse, and he got very heavy very quickly from not exercising. Um, but we got him back, and... Um, Barry had had the idea of, Barry Irwin from Team Barry had had the idea of running him in Dubai in the World Cup. Um, so we picked out a race for him in Florida, which was now in January or February, which he won very easily. Um, this was his first race back after the injury. And we were set to go to Dubai. The last time I worked him before we were to get on the, get on the plane the following week, he came back lame. And I just assumed that he'd re-injured the hawk and that it was probably all over. Um, as it turned out, it was, a, it was a different injury. It was in the same area, but it was a completely different injury. Uh, and the first thing Barry said to me was, okay, well, we'll shoot for the Dubai World Cup 2013, which I thought was absolutely absurd at the time. <laughs> but sure enough, that's what we did. Um, we came back and ran him in the Breeders' Cup um, when he ran a, a remarkable race, I thought, to be second. And, uh, you know, then we ended up heading to Dubai in March, so... And as Dan can attest, that wouldn't be the first thing that Barry came up with that someone said was absurd. No, that's, that's probably true. Well, I won't ask you to comment on that. <laughs> you know, we actually worked very well together because we often had, I mean, to, to bring the horse back in the Breeders' Cup was pretty unusual. I don't think many owners would have let me do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he had enough confidence in the horse and for some reason in me that we would get the horse back to that, in that race. And it was... Uh, I thought it was a really good idea until the week before the race when I started thinking it was probably the craziest thing I'd ever done. But <laughs> fortunately, he ran really well. And, um, but he was the kind of horse that made us all look good, I think. Yeah. Well, I want to ask just a few questions, uh, really, of both of you. Um, let you answer uh, in whatever order you want or, or talk among yourselves. But how is what the two of you do, what you do, do you think the same, and how is it different? You go first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I think a huge part of, of, of my game is, is keeping, and I'm sure Graham's too, is keeping the horses healthy and, and happy. And um, I think they're not maybe necessarily together, um, but I think it's, it's, it's very important. That, you know, a horse that's obviously not healthy, he's not going to perform, but if he's not happy, he's not going to perform either. And so I think that, um, you know, uh, from talking to Stuart and talking to to Graham that, you know, the, the one day, I think we sort of have a little bit the same feeling. You got to treat each horse as their own horse and not really have a schedule put out for them, but let them tell you where they want to go kind of thing. And um, so I think, you know, for me, that's, that's really the similarity is, you know, can you keep the horse, you know, healthy and happy? And if you can do that, they're going to last longer. And I feel like with anything, if they can last longer, they're going to get stronger, they're going to get better, and um, they're going to be more successful. Yeah, and I think it's interesting hearing you say, uh, you know, about you're hoping the horse is at his best coming up to this week at Rolex. You know, they have to be sound. And I think it's, it's no more evident than these two weeks leading up to the Derby where you see horses get hurt. I mean, we're, we're all kind of, you know, you can have a Derby horse, but you've still got to get them there. And I, the year Animal Kingdom won, I actually had a horse called Toby's Corner who was probably much more liked than even Animal Kingdom was, and he was hurt in his last workout. So I think you really live on pins and needles the whole time, just hoping when you walk in the barn the next morning that they're, they're sound and, and, and doing well. So. Yeah. I, know I, I don't think people quite realize how much 
that plays into it, you know, and how much you know every day when you walk into the bar and there's going to be an issue and you just hope it's not that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well said. Um, Graham, what would you say are things that you learned from observing eventing or steeplechase horses that, that help you and buck kind of the opposite? What are things you think that you've observed from the thoroughbred industry that helps you? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I haven't been around Buck a lot as far as the training. We have a horse now with, uh, with Philip called Ichabod, Ichabod Crane. And it's very interesting seeing the similarities. I mean, I think what goes into what we do so much, I mean, the horses need to be fit. I think when you, when you bring a horse that's not prepared properly or not fit or, or hasn't done enough training, that's when they're going to get hurt. So I think that's probably one of the most important things. And, and I find I have to be so patient, which I think is the same with you guys, that patience is so important. And if you rush them into doing anything, I think that's when you can do the most damage, probably. Yeah, I, I agree completely with, with Graham. They, they have to be fit. If, they, if they're not fit now in our game, um, they have to be fit, but they have to be sane. Um, because the, the dressage is a big deal, you know? Like, if you, if you can't do a dressage test, and if they're not relaxed and rideable in the show jumping, they're going to they're gonna knock rails down as well. So, um, you know, I think the, the similarities there, are, uh, and I've ridden, you know, I, I went and worked as a kid in, in England and galloped for a trainer called Kim Bailey, who um, won the Grand, English Grand National. And I was fortunate enough to ride a horse called Mr. Frisk, who won the Grand National. And um, seems to me, and maybe Graham could correct me, but it seems to me, you know, there's exceptions, but most of the most successful horses in whatever discipline have generally the best brain. You know, it's uh, the horse that gets really wound up before going to the start of the race, used to, raced his race before he even got to the start, and I think it's definitely the same in the event. Yeah, again, I mean, to use the Kentucky Derby as an example, I mean, you're not going to have a horse go out and run his best race if he's lost the plot in the paddock. I mean, the, the horse that runs well in the derby is a horse that walks out cool as a cucumber. He's totally unfazed by the crowd. And I always, you know, have thought in years past watching horses and noticing the ones that do well. Um, it, it's remarkable, really, what we put them through and how well they handle it. But the ones that handle it the best on the day, it doesn't matter how talented they are, like any pro athlete, if, if they lose it on the, on the day, they're not going to perform well. Yeah. I think, and I think, too, just, um, you know, Graham didn't know who I was until about whenever when we went to watch Patinka um, uh, race that day. But like I've always watched him and admired him and how he, you know, I study. You know, I go home and I study jockeys in England. I study trainers in America, and um, you know, looking at what Graham does. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Graham, but I think you, Shepherd, John and Shepherd lived, you know, a mile down the road from where I was where I was born and um, brought up. Jonathan and my dad, I think, are very similar people. They're very, very driven, very hardworking, but most of all, they care about the horse. And, um, you know, with dad, it was never a clock. It was never, you know, <clears throat> that they had to do this. It was, you know, well, this horse should gallop this day. And, you know what, he's supposed to gallop, but he's going to go for a trot that day. And I, I feel like just looking from the outside, that um, and my mom um, actually galloped for Jonathan, as, um, you know, in the last few years actually, and um, I think that the similarities in, in Jonathan and my dad are seem to me to be quite similar, and I, I think that um, you, Graham, and I sort of feel the same way in training horses, even though it's dis different dis disciplines. I think we li literally been brought up about the same way. So really adaptability is what you're talking about that you have to adapt every day with your horses and um, maybe he was going to gallop but you look at him and you say no. And yeah, they, you've got to listen to them rather than tell them. I think yeah. they, they can tell us a heck of a lot more than we can tell them. Yeah. Okay. If, if we were to <clears throat> lead 10 horses in here and have you guys look at them for, for your discipline, would you be looking for different attributes in a horse? Never trained a derby winner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, would, would you be looking for different things for eventing, Graham? Would you be looking for different things for flat racing? Perhaps correctness is a little more important than what we do. I don't know, but because of the speed, I think that's the big difference. Is 
the speed that they're going, and they, they have to hold up to it. So I, I would imagine that we would probably be a little choosier about correcting us. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, our sport, it's the dressage is so important. So where a racehorse, you might not worry so much about their trot. That's a, that's a, a gate that we have to pay attention to. Um, I still think over the long haul, the horse that, that has a great walk and a great canter is going to last longer in, in our sport. And it, it's, you know, we do two out of three phases in the canter anyway. So, um, you know, the dress size world, they say the trot is what wins. Um, and that may be true in the event world in the dress size, but over the long haul, the horse that can't walk and can't gallop isn't going to last long enough to be trained to the level that a, maybe a steadier, even, you know, more even mover um, we'll get to. And if you look at, you know, the last few years, you look at the Olympic champion, the Babbitton champion, the world champion, the horse is not a flamboyant mover, but he has a great walk, he has a great dis disposition, and um, he has a great canter. And it's, they don't, you know, and that, that brain that, <clears throat> I think if you look at the top 10 horses at Kentucky or Babbitton or Burley, they might all be a different color, a different shape, but you would take any one of them. You would look at them and say, I like that horse. And I think it's probably the same if you, when you're in the paddock at the Derby. They might be a different color, a different size, a different shape, but you'd take any one of them. And there's that something that I don't know what it is, but there's that it factor. And I think when Graham's looking for a horse and I'm looking for a horse, it's got to have that it factor. And for me, if I go home at night and I can't stop thinking about it, Maybe I'm crazy, but that's for me the it factor. It's okay, and if I eh, forget it, it doesn't matter. Um, you, you know, I'm sure in, in the in the race world that it factor is everything. Graham, who would you say is is the best horse that you didn't train that you've run against that you run a horse against? Hmm, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of really good horses that I've had a lot of huge amount of respect for a horse like Tis now comes to mind. I didn't run against him, but he was just a really durable, hard-knocking horse. He came back and won the Breeders' Cup two years in a row. Mm -hmm. So that's a horse that I've always really admired, a kind of a real iron horse. I think. Mm -hmm. And has made a good sire, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Buck, who would you say is a, a horse that uh, you guys didn't breed, didn't, didn't train, but, but somebody in eventing that you just went, wow, I wish I owned him? Um, sort of the, the one that comes to mind is uh, a horse that Andrew Nicholson rides called Noreo. Um, he has um, been obviously wildly successful, um, but again, he's lasted a long time. He might not be the, the fanciest horse, or the you know, but again, he had that it factor. And that horse is just—it's just a winner. It just um, at every level, it's you know, it's just always it's never blown anybody away, but it's always there. And if it doesn't win, it's third or fourth or. Second, it's just right there all the time. Okay. I'm going to move into the student questions. Um, and the, the, this first group is for both of you to answer. Uh, what is your favorite venue to compete in and why? Definitely Keeneland because I'm here. And so <laughs> I'd be wrong if I, if I said it any differently. But I, I really love racing here. Buck? Yeah, I mean, in America, if you're an event rider, it's, it's Rolex. It's... Uh, I mean, you can go all around the world, and you're not going to find better facilities than we have at the horse park. What would you say is your single greatest moment or memory related to this business? I mean, for me, it would have to be the Derby or the Dubai World Cup. They, they were both extraordinary uh, races to win, races that I, I never imagined I would win a race like that. Buck? Um, I know, I, you know I, probably for me, it's... You know, I love riding the young horses and bringing them up, and so it's probably a stupid ride around a training level, you know, on a horse that, oh, man, this one may be it someday. Um, you know, I had a ride in a two-star last week that it was a simple two-star, and it was one of the best rides of my life, you know, on a horse that's sort of middle of the road. But, um, you know, there's the My Boy Bobby, there's the Mystic Mike and the Reggie last year in Kentucky, and, you know, so Kentucky is just a special place, but I, I'm not sure I have one ride that was just, wow, that's it for me. What are the most difficult barriers to overcome when entering your field as a professional? Wow. 
I mean, there's so many. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the biggest things for me is the confidence. You know, you, you only get confidence by, by training. And as you've been training longer, you get more confident in how to do things and which races to run in and taking a shot here. So I, I think that's a huge factor for me is, is having confidence and also not losing your confidence when you have a bad run because it can be so humbling, you know. Um, and you can go for a couple of weeks without having a winner and sort of question everything you've ever done, you know. But you have to just keep the keep the path. Buck? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the, there's not one thing. I, I think the, the biggest thing in, in my business is, and uh, I'm sure Graham's too, is, is communication um, with everybody. It's It really is a team. It's... Um, you know, sometimes we get the headlines, but there's so many people behind the scenes that, um, you know, without them, it doesn't work. And so I think, for me, as people want to get into this industry is, you know, figure out how to build a team and build a great team around you. And um, that will, you know, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer, whatever, I think that team is so important because it's so much bigger than just you. Mm -hmm. When, when starting and advancing your horse's educations, how much groundwork do you do and what sort of exercises do you use? Yeah, I mean, with the young horses, so much of that is done before I even get them, which is the way it's done in this country with the two-year-olds. You know, I, I, I'm just starting to get two-year-olds in now, so if, if you consider that groundwork, that a lot of the early training is already done. Um, you know, like I said earlier, I think it's so important to be patient and not rush the horses into their first work. I mean, I'll, I'll usually jog a horse for three or four weeks before we even start galloping. I'll usually gallop a horse for at least four weeks before we even go on to a breeze. So um, I think patience pays off and, and the longer you can give them, you know, the chances are they're gonna stay sounder. Buck? Um, you know, as a kid, I did a lot of, you know, at my family's farm, they did, there's a lot of breeding, and so I would, you know, break a lot of babies, and uh, you know, so I'm not sure there's one exercise or whatever that I, you know, that I do, but you know, you teach the horse to, you know, walk, trot, canter, go in a frame, um, go in the right balance, um, you know, work off both leads, do flying changes, things like that, to, um, you know, get the horse working with you and get them built up their strength you know, get their strength built up evenly. I think that's really important rather than just going one way or, or, uh, or the other. Um, if you can build them up evenly, you know, again, they should last longer. Great. What are a couple of the biggest changes you've seen in the industry in the past 10 years? Well, I think one of the biggest changes is a lot less people go to the races now because you can watch it all on television. I mean, that's changed so dramatically since when I first came around. Um, and I think it's the way it's going to be, and I think we need to accept that. And uh, as an industry, the, the facilities are going to be a lot smaller. Um, a lot of people watch from home. I watch from home a lot of the time. Um, so I, th I think that's probably the most significant change that I I would notice um, from the outside looking in. Bob? Yeah, from, from in my sport, it's certainly the safety aspect of it. You know, we have um, fences that fall down now. If you hit them at a certain angle or a certain pressure, um, you know, and Everything is getting more and more geared to the, the safety of the horse and the rider. And, um, you know, obviously the, the communication, the PR, the, the TV, the media is, is more involved than it was 10 years ago. Nobody had an idea. But in our sport, the safety is, is a big thing. And, uh, and, it, and it's great. It's, um, you know, for, for the rider, we have, you know, air vests that blow up if we fall off or... You know, if the horse hits the fence at the wrong angle, the fence just gives way and breaks. So um, hopefully, you know, stopping those, those falls that nobody likes to see. How do, how do you approach training a hot-tempered horse? <clears throat> From a distance? Would that be? <laughs> <laughs> Give it to somebody else. This is something that we've, you know, at Fair Hill where I train in Maryland, I'm, I'm not on the racetrack, so I think it's something we can really do well with. Um, you know, we turn all the horses out. We try to turn all the horses out before they train. And I think that's, I think that's so important. It's something that Jonathan did. Um, it's, it makes so much difference to the horses mentally. I mean, Jonathan would actually turn five or six 
Billy's hours together at a time, which would horrify me. And I'd, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. But, uh, you know, he's always done it, and it works. And it has a remarkable way of, of selling the horses down and just keeping them kind of in their natural environment. It's, it's a, there's a lot to be said for it. Buck, how about hot-tempered horses with eventing? Well, yeah, for, for me, at this stage of my life, I try to stay away from them. And, you know, like, <laughs> it, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's hard when you ride 10 or 15 horses at a horse show and you've got five minutes to warm up for the dressage. It doesn't really work so well if they're hot-tempered. But um, usually I'll have somebody, thankfully I'm marrying a girl that's pretty good in the dressage, and... Uh, <laughs> Here you go, Andre. You take this one and have some fun with it. And <laughs> she'll be out there for two or three hours, and uh, then I'll ride at the horse show and look like, look pretty good. <laughs> what is your best piece of advice for an individual thinking about entering the equine industry? I think the hard, I, I think the harder the harder you work, the luckier you get. I mean, that really sums it up. I think it's about hard work. It's about connections. You can't make enough connections. Certainly in in my aspect of the game, um, that's what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, I, it, <clears throat> for me, it's, you've got to be able to deal with disappointment. As you know, it's, it's not as lucrative as everybody thinks it is, and it, there's a lot more bad days than there are good. But the, uh, you know, the good days for sure outweigh the bad days, and uh, there are way <clears throat> worse ways we could be making a living. What confirmation faults are you willing or not willing to overlook for racing and eventing? I mean, I, I tend to think we get a little too picky in our business because you'll, you'll see a lot of incorrect horses perform very well for a long time. So uh, I think we tend to get too carried away in finding the perfect individual. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty forgiving. I'm able to forgive a lot. But yeah, for us, it's something stupid like a horse that has a really short neck you, you have no chance the dressage is so important and you know that short neck makes them look tense and um, so a short neck and uh, for me um, a horse that's back at the knee or straight in front um, you know even if they are good enough with their shoulders they tend to hit the show jumps on the way up and so you know a horse that's over at the knee seems to last longer as far as their legs and, and they seem to jump better um, but one that's back at the knee and straight in front, I don't want anything to do with it. Okay. Now I have three or four um, just for Buck and then three or four just for Graham that students uh, submitted. And then I think I have a few more on another page and, and we're just about done here. So Buck, this, uh, what is the craziest thing that has ever happened to you in eventing? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, been a few things. Uh, <laughs> Somebody has a sense of humor. Yeah, um, I don't know the, the craziest thing. I mean, I've had some, I've had some, uh, you know, I've had some falls, obviously, that were fairly gnarly. I guess the craziest thing that ever happened to me was um, probably not the answer maybe they're looking for, but I met Superman, and uh, you know, when I was a kid, um, I was at Fair Hill, and you know, he was uh, he was there, and. That for me is, uh, you know, one thing that sticks out is like the craziest thing. Like, super, and then, you know, poor Superman obviously gets, uh, you know, he gets paralyzed in a, in a riding accident. Right. And that, that um, if you talk about the craziest thing, I mean, it's kind of crazy. Superman can't walk, right? Like, that's, that, that's, that's crazy. But, um, you know, the, uh, uh, from a riding standpoint, um, Probably the, the craziest thing that ever happened to me was winning the national championship with a horse called Mythic Mike. Um, he was one of those horses that, um, you know, we, we bred or the, the owner bred and really nobody would buy him. And, you know, he just kind of went up through the ranks and, you know, had his day in the sun at, at Kentucky that weekend. Um, you know, Jan Smith is, uh, has been one of my best friends. She was my first ever owner. And she bred him, and uh, that weekend, it was one of those weekends that I'll never forget. I remember on Sunday night after, after uh, winning the championship at Kentucky, Jan and I were at Outback, and Jan looked at me, and she said, you know, Buck, most people are out partying after something like this, and the two of us are sitting here at Outback, and you know, that's kind of been sort of my career is, you know, I'm, I'm not a big, wild person. It's, uh, you know, I have, 
I'm really fortunate to have some really close relationships with people that have uh, supported me for a long time. And you know, so from an outside perspective, that's probably a crazy thing. How do you mentally prepare for an event like Rolex? Um, well, for me, I, I try to get here early and um, get away from all the, the other stuff that's going on at, at my farm and um, all the other people and all the questions and all the, yada, 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 you know, the daily business of it. And um, just really try to focus on the job at hand. And um, going back to the crazy thing, I spend a lot of time, like I do my best thinking in the bathroom. So I'll go and stand in the porta pot and just think. That way I know nobody's gonna come and find me there. And so when you can't find me, that's where I go, you know? And so guaranteed there's nobody gonna be able to get in there. So that's, again, crazy, but. That might be the answer for the craziest the, the, thing. Exactly. Uh, but again, going back to the cat thing, you start to understand me a little bit. Uh, I guess so. But uh, it, it, for me, it's literally getting even if it's 30 seconds or a minute of just quiet time where I, I'm not the smartest guy here. Um, and so there's, I don't want a lot of stuff going on in my brain, but I do need to think for a couple of seconds, what am I gonna do? This is what I need to do and boom, let's do it. Good. Which phase of eventing is most challenging for you personally? <laughs> it depends on the horse. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, that's the honest answer. It's, um, you know, in our sport it's, so unique. We, we obviously have the dressage and, and the cross country and the show jumping. Everybody gets into eventing because of the cross country, right? The excitement and the, the thrill. You can go and do dressage and just do dressage, or you can go and do just pure show jumping, but you can't go and just do pure cross country. Um, and so the cross country is what brought us all into the game. Uh, you know, for me, I, I grew up in the racing, fox hunting background, and so the dressage was something that I really had to work on. But Again, if I have a horse that's good in the dressage and, and no good in the cross country, well, you know, that's a bit stressful. So it really does depend on the horse. Good. Graham, here's a, a few from the students for you. Can you talk about a couple of changes you would like to see in horse racing to improve the general public's perception of racing? Well, I think the medication is no secret. That's, that's a huge issue right now with, with the industry. So I, I think the sooner we can deal with that, the better quite frankly, um, and, and how that's going to happen, I don't know. We have a terrible problem in our industry where everything is state controlled and, and we really need a, a governing body who's going to lay down the rules and stick by them and, and everyone will have to stick by them. So I, I think that's probably the most important thing that we need to deal with right now. Good. This student asked, how did you get Animal Kingdom to run so big off the long layoff in the Breeders' Cup mile? That's a good question. I mean, it was, uh, first of all, I had such confidence in this horse. I mean, he's the horse of a lifetime. He could do things that no other horse I'd ever had could do or ever will do. I really believe that. So, you know, I, I knew I had the horse. Um, I think being at Fair Hill was a huge factor. We have the sleeper safe course that you're familiar with there, um, which we're able to train on once a week. And, and I, I took him over there and worked him at least four or five times. And they were really stiff works. Works that you wouldn't be able to do on a, on a flat track, mm -hmm. um, kind of almost u more European style. And he did things leading up to the Breeders' Cup that I didn't, you know, I've taken horses over the steeplechase course quite a bit over the years, and I'd never seen a horse do what this horse did leading up to the Breeders' Cup. He was spectacular. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the recent boom in finding second homes for thoroughbreds? Well, I think it's so important. I mean, I think we all have a responsibility to, to find homes for these, ho these animals that have done so much for us. Um, we recently re acquired this horse, Ichabod Crane, that my wife's been responsible in, in placing with Philip. Um, and, and a lot of the reason why she's done that is because we want to bring more awareness to it. And, you know, fortunately in the area that we're in, in, in Pennsylvania and Maryland, there are so many outlets for horses. And I, I just feel, I think we both feel really strongly that this is something that's so important. I think it's... Uh, it's a responsibility. They they give us so much, and, and we need to, in return, take care of them when their their careers are over. This student asks, can, can you remember what was going through your mind when Animal Kingdom was coming down the stretch in the Derby, and when he hit the wire? I think I thought 
you know, this horse can probably win the Kentucky Derby, and this would be the cruelest thing if somebody comes and nails him right on the board. <laughs> <laughs> that was what was going through my mind. <laughs> have time for a couple more? Are we okay? Okay. Um, this is also for you, Graham. How do you decide whether a horse will be good at sprinting or longer distance or turf or dirt? Yeah, a lot of it's trial and error. Um, you know, you really don't know until you try a horse. I mean, you know, you may think a horse can go a mile and a half, but until you actually try it, you're probably not going to know. Um, you can get a pretty good feel for whether a horse is going to be a sprinter or a turf horse or a dirt horse, often by their, their action. You know, if they have a very high knee action, you might, on, when they're traveling on the dirt, you'll, you'll probably figure they'd, they'd prefer to be on the grass. Um, the synthetic track is, is very helpful to me because when a horse handles a synthetic track, which we train on at Fair Hill, um, you get a pretty good feel for they're gonna handle the grass. Most of them handle the grass. So um, the really good ones will do any of those things, but I think, uh, I think until you actually try a horse, um, over a route of ground, you, you, you're never really going to know whether they can do it or not. You get a fair number of homebreds with the owners that you have, so does that help, you know, being familiar with the pedigrees and the, and the dams? Definitely. And I mean, yeah. when, when we're trying to figure out which way to go with a horse, you certainly put a lot of uh, credence into the pedigree, but there have been some horses over the years, and Cigar is the first one that comes to mind that have thro completely thrown that out the window, mm -hmm. so um, I think sometimes you can be too caught up in the, in the pedigrees and the family. Mm -hmm. This student asks, how do you know when a horse is ultimately ready to race? I mean, I think that's again, comes back to the whole confidence and, and the feel you have for getting a horse to a race. Um, I, you know, even to this day, I'll often still question myself. You know, you, you can point a horse for a race for a long time, and then the last week before they're ready to run, you'll think, I just don't know if I got him quite fit enough. So, you know, every horse is different. Some horses, it takes a lot more than others. I mean, usually as a rule, we'll work a horse at least eight or nine times before he runs for the first time, and that's sort of my guideline. Some horses you'll get away with a little less, some horses will take a little more. Mm -hmm. And Buck, this question is from a student for you. Can you provide an experience when you knew you had a horse that was really special? Um, <clears throat> I had uh, probably the best example of that is um, Reggie, that's uh, here this weekend. When he was eight, eight years old, he got on the list for the, the Olympic Games. And we had a training session and camp down in North Carolina for two weeks or three weeks or something. And at that point in eventing, they just introduced the flying changes. And um, <clears throat> in practice and lead up and all that stuff, um, they just weren't happening. It, it wasn't happening at all. He, he couldn't do he couldn't do any of them. No matter what I tried, didn't work. Whatever I got told to do didn't work. Um, and so I thought, well, I've got an eight-year-old horse. It's probably too early for him anyway. And in our final mandatory competition, he went down and did four fantastic flying changes and won the competition. And I thought, man, there's something about this horse, and you know, it's not really. As they say in the races, it's not really how they train in the morning, it's how they go in the afternoon. Mm. And, you know, that's Reggie is, when they've turned the lights on, he has always showed up. And um, I remember that weekend and that day in particular thinking, how did this happen? I've had it happen many times the other way where they were going perfect and it all went wrong. But, like, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, Carl. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, it, uh, you know, I didn't see that coming. And... Uh, from that day forward, I knew he was, you know, a big time player. You, you know, the agent that buys the horse always knew. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just one last one from a student here, Buck, and writes, what's the most important thing you look for in a successful three-day horse? It's no more complicated than a, a good eye. Like a horse with a good eye can't be a bad horse. And uh, so if I can look them at the, in the eye and they'll look me in the eye, we'll be fine. I know I speak for everyone here. I want to start with, with thanking Stuart Brown for putting this together and coming up with this idea, but thanking both of you for um, the wisdom that you have imparted to these students and, and others here tonight and how much we genuinely appreciate your time being here.
There are so many people to thank tonight, and on behalf of the administration of the College of Agriculture, Food, and the Environment, and my colleagues in the equine programs, we would like to express our sincere thanks to Haggards for sponsoring tonight's event, and specifically to Dr. Brown for what I uh, said earlier were his heroic efforts in managing the logistics of getting these, this, the dream team here uh, together tonight. Um, I would also like to give a huge thanks to Buck Davidson and Graham Motion for taking times out of your incredibly busy schedules to speak with our students. Um, I would like for you to look out at the sea of faces and know that Big Blue Nation will be cheering for you at Rolex and Keeneland and the Derby. Um, we're, it's, it's such a thrill to have you here. Um, and Dan, you always do such a masterful job of moderating this event, and we thank you so much for sharing your talents and time with our students. Um, this was just fantastic, so thank you very much. Thank you.